of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. If you're worshiping in person this morning, you are strongly encouraged to wear a mask in the church and may join aloud in the spoken prayers and on the songs. We, are, we advise that if you sing aloud only three feet away from anyone not living in your household. There are a couple of announcements. One is that the delivery of the pumpkins has been changed to Monday, September 26th at 4.30 p.m. Please come help us settle the pumpkins in for our annual pumpkin patch sale. Is there any other announcements that need to be shared with the church? All right, well then, song. we're going into our song, so if you're able to stand, please stand and join us in song.
Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you. If you haven't met me, I'm Pastor Jeff. It's nice to have you here. Everybody doing well today? Yeah? Awesome. Good. You know, uh, what Dakota had a celebration, didn't you? You were our Miss Altamont Fair, yes? Isn't that great, huh? We have Miss Altamont Fair with us. Yeah, right? Hey, anybody ever play a game called Simon Says? Yeah? Okay. Do you remember what it's about? Okay, let me see. Um, Simon Says, clap your hands. Simon Says, stop. You stop it twice. Look. Simon Says, stand up. Simon says, turn to your left. Turn to your right. No, I'm a news anchor. Simon says, sit down. You did pretty good following directions, didn't you, huh? Pretty good. That was fun. I like Simon says. And um, Jesus had 12 disciples, and he taught them. He said, follow me. Do what I do. He said, Jesus says, Feed my sheep. Huh? What do we do? We feed the sheep. We take care of hungry people, right? Jesus said, pray with me. Jesus said, heal the sick. Chase out the demons and bring God's kingdom on earth. Isn't that wonderful? And guess what? That's not just for the disciples. That's for us. How can we follow Jesus today? What can you do to follow Jesus? like a disciple. Huh? Can you think of anything you can do? Read the Bible, follow me, study the Word, yeah. Become more like Jesus, yeah. That's what happens when we follow somebody else and we, we copy and we do Simon Says, we do what somebody says and we learn to do certain things, right? So by watching Jesus, they learn to do, to feed the sheep and do those things. Because Jesus had compassion and Jesus loved children. You can donate? Is that what you said? Yeah, we can donate. That's right. We can give to the food pantry. We can give to others. Feed my sheep when people are hungry. But some people are hungry for spiritual food. Inside they're hurt. They're sad. They're very sad. And we can go and we can cheer them up and talk to them, can't we? We can show them our little toys and brighten their day like Anna does for me. Yeah. So that's what it is. Simon says, Jesus says, follow me and do what I do. That's a great message. That's what we all need to do, huh? Yes. God bless you. You are wonderful. Thank you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the example you give us. And, and Simon says, we're reminded that we are to follow you and do as you do. Help us, Lord, to see people in need in our families and in our schools and just our friends and everyone we run into, Lord, and to, to be your hands and your feet and your compassion and to love them and make them happy and help them to heal, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please help yourself to some candy and you are... You can follow Dakota if you'd like to go and have some young disciples time together. Isn't that great? God bless you.
Are we working? Yeah, you can hear me, Axel. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Okay. If I say, can you hear me, and you say no, I know you're not telling the truth, right? Are you with me? Good. It's great to see you. What a beautiful, warm August day and a beautiful morning to be together. And lo and behold, I have voice. You can hear, can you hear me now? All right, isn't that wonderful, the gift of technology. Um, we gather together and we uh, take this time to pray together and we lift up our spoken prayers. And I know there's a lot of prayers that weigh heavy on some of your hearts that are just too difficult maybe even to speak right now. But I wanted to take time for us to lift those prayers up together and come before God. So I have a few prayers. Um, Emily Leffingwell, who usually is down over here, uh, she was in this week, and she is going to college in Binghamton, and she'd be leaving today. So keep her and all our college students, uh, Charlie, Lelena, the, the Beauregards are traveling, and others who are returning to school. Yes, everybody's starting college, and um, we need to pray for our students. It's exciting at first semester to do well and know that their church is praying for them. Um, Cassie Breedlove is Jackson Breedlove's mom. She's had a lot of problems with uh, blood sugar and different things and surgery. She had another procedure this week for her eyes and her sight, so we lift her up and pray for healing. Um, my cousin Penny, uh, her father-in-law, John Adamak, took a fall and has broken his hip, I believe, so we're praying for him for healing. And our, our l beloved former pastor, Terry O'Neill, has been experiencing some health issues that have been dragging on for several weeks. I uh, interacted with him on Facebook through messaging, and um, he appreciates our prayers, so keep Terry in our prayers. A uh, family friend of Melissa's parents, uh, Phil, with prostate cancer. We lift him up and pray for healing for him. And a co-worker of Melissa's, Elijah, uh, we welcome baby Elijah, 2 o'clock this morning, to the world. Um, Maureen had lifted up um, Chris's dad, Gar, with an infection that was uh, ba bacterial and resistant to antibiotics a couple weeks ago. So I haven't had an update, but we're going to lift up Gar in our prayers. And also Jason Laska, who uh, received a new heart. And we're praying for that heart to, to be accepted. Um, Mary Mossman, who's usually over there, is uh, having treatments for um, some cancer going on there. So we lift her up and pray for those treatments to be effective. Um, Sandy's sister, Denise, yes, has uh, been detected with another fourth kind of cancer, and this one can spread and go to the brain. And so we're praying for doctors, nurses, everyone, the technicians to uh, the medications to be powerful and God's Holy Spirit to just um, invade that cancer and erase it and eradicate it from her. We're praying for that spirit to be poured out on her and all those who may be dealing with illness and cancer and treatments today. Um, continue to lift up Wendy Fox for healing and is she doing better? All right, God bless her, thank you. Um, do you have any uh, urgent prayers or prayers on your heart that didn't make it onto the prayer list there, Frank? Okay. Thank you. Get them on the prayer list. Will you write that down? We'll continue to lift them up. Janie Schweikert also, I know we're praying for. Um, any others that you're aware of? Sandy? You have to speak up. I can't hear. Okay. Gloria Mackey. Mm. 
Wonderful. Cancer free after all that, yeah. Praise God. It's a miracle. Yeah, we have them today. They still go on. We thank God for that healing for her. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Um, anything online back there? No prayers online this morning. Then let's take a moment then to uh, just take a breath and just be in the presence of God and quiet our busy minds and everything that's going on in our lives and just put that to rest for a moment and bring your prayers, your concerns, your joys before our Creator, our Father God. Gracious God, it's so good to be still in your presence, to find peace in the chaos of our lives. Lord, we pray for all those who are suffering today and are feeling least, last, lost, or maybe struggling in body, mind, or spirit. There are so many, Lord, who are like sheep without a shepherd. Inspire us, use us, help us, Lord, to be those who reach out, to be the hands, the feet, the voice of Christ for those who are hurting. We thank you, Lord, for your healing mercies, for the hope that you give in the midst of disappointment and discouragement and heartache. Heal our brokenness. Heal our broken hearts, Lord change those circumstances and let us see your hand at work in our lives, oh God. We thank you for the prayers you've answered and for hearing these prayers even now. So Lord, we gather and we pray as your children the prayer that you've taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, 
and the glory forever. Amen. Today's reading comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James' son Zebedee and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired men and followed him. Thank you, Matt. It's so good to have you with us again today, and appreciate your volunteering and reading. It's good to have you all here today as well. So um, we've been in this series, and today we're going to continue the series. It's based on that song, you know, that I told you about that haunted me for weeks, and it still comes up and when I'm driving. And it's called A Little More Like Jesus and A Little Less Like Me. It's becoming more like Jesus and giving up a little more of me and transitioning. Today we're going to look at a change, a shift in our lifestyle from following and following the crowd to leading like Christ. And that's a big one. And it's something that the world and we in the church needs desperately, to go from following the crowd to leading like Christ. Huh? Most of us are pretty good at following, or, or else we would not be Christians at all to, say, to tell the truth. But something happened, something happens when Jesus who first asked us to follow him, then suddenly asks us or tells us to lead. The call to follow becomes the call to lead in the very circles in which we once followed. Our prayers become intercessions. Our volunteering becomes ministry. Our careers become a calling. And we, who were once sheep, become shepherds. The call to follow Jesus was never about joining him to go to heaven. That came way later. The call to follow Jesus is about joining him in bringing heaven here. If you missed, if you missed it, this entire series has been about how we can transform our lives into lives that imitate the life of Jesus. So today we want to talk about making that shift from sheep to shepherd. Jesus' desire is that we each would catch his heart to shepherd others. He wants us to, to catch the heart of Jesus and to be people who not only want to, but go out and actively shepherd other people. Whether you realize it or not, God has placed people in your life that God wants you to shepherd with the heart of Jesus. People today are coming to Christ for all kinds of reasons. But when you read the Gospels, you discover something very unsettling. What drives people to Jesus today is not what drove the disciples. And that might explain why so few people who come to Jesus today ever end up following him. People who come today to Christ are often looking for forgiveness. They're looking for meaning in their lives, or they're looking for a quick fix because their lives are not working out. But have you ever noticed that none of the disciples, as far as we know, came to Jesus for any of those reasons? Rather, they followed Jesus simply because they passed him one day, and he said to them, follow me. Isn't that where contemporary Christianity 
often gets stuck, huh? When we offer it as a way to cure something, like sin, or as a guarantee of something, like heaven, we run the risk of having new believers lose interest once they believe that their religion has done for them what they hoped it would do. So if their Christianity is shallow, it isn't because people are disinterested. It is more likely that they just don't get it. That's what becoming more like Jesus and less like me is all about. When we move in our lives from being sheep to becoming shepherds, we begin to take on the responsibility of someone else's spiritual life. We begin to worry, perhaps for the first time in our lives, about the spiritual climate of the places where we work and live. To follow Jesus, to be a follower, is to become like Jesus. Following Jesus, it entails both obeying his teaches, teachings and imitating his example. But that's not all there is. Obeying and imitating are not the ends, in the, the ends in themselves. They are just means to a greater end. The end or the goal of discipleship is to become more like Jesus himself. And that means to think like he thought to feel like he felt, to act like he acted, to desire what he desired. As John puts it in 1 John 2, 6, whoever says they abide in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Because Jesus is the image of God in human form, as we become more and more like him, the image of God increasingly restores our lives. So, let's take a look. How were the first disciples called? From the very beginning, Jesus hinted that he had big plans for them and for us. Using Mark's gospel once again, let's take a look at the pattern of Jesus' call to his first disciples because it is the same call that is for you and I. In Mark 1, 15 through 20, Jesus began preaching that the kingdom of heaven had come and he called his disciples to follow him and become fishers of people. It is you think that it's only because he's standing by the seashore that Jesus used this metaphor of fishermen. He's standing by the seashore and talking to fishermen. That's not it. Do you think maybe it could have been because he intentionally was borrowing a metaphor from Jeremiah who predicted that one day when God was ready to restore his people, the Lord will send for many fishermen, and they will catch them. From the very beginning, Jesus was not simply looking for followers or attracting crowds. He was on a mission. Implicit is the, in the call to follow is the call to enlist, not just to follow, but to enlist, to sign up, to become part of it, commit. With his disciples, Jesus continued moving from town to town and doing the same three things. Preaching the gospel, healing disease, and delivering the oppressed from evil. In Mark 3, 13 and 14, Jesus pulls his disciples aside and commissions them to be with him and to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. In Mark 6, 7 through 13, he gave them authority over evil spirits. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. In Mark 6, 30 through 44, 
even after the disciples began to preach and heal, there was one more thing, one more thing that Jesus wanted them to do. After calling them away again in verse 31, he saw the crowd that was gathering and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. When the disciples insisted that he send the people away so that they could go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy something to eat, Jesus handed them the keys and conferred onto them the authority and the responsibility of a shepherd. He said, you give them something to eat. The implication of all, of all this is clear, and it is powerful. First, Jesus did not come simply to save us, but to recruit us. Jesus is already partway through the campaign and is trying to recruit us to join, to get on board. To anyone who once thought that being a Christian meant to be nice, and to follow Jesus, this is a perturbing thought. Jesus came to recruit us. And secondly, Jesus is recruiting us to be more than leaders. He is recruiting us to become shepherds. What's the difference? Let's take a look at the difference between a leader versus a shepherd. You see, shepherds have internal qualities that set them apart. Sometimes they do things um, other people do, but shepherds have an extra dimension to their work that flows straight from their heart. You can see it in a shepherd. It's from their heart when they're caring for others. Shepherds have compassion toward their sheep. They are not critical because they know their sheep's limitations. They can empathize with those under their care. Shepherds know their sheep by name. They spend time with their sheep. They hear the same old stories and put up with the same old mundane things. But it is here in the small talk that the sheep learn their shepherd's voice. Leaders don't lead with voice as much as they do with vision. They decide where the flock needs to go, but they don't worry much about who or how many are going. Shepherds are self-forgetful. They lay down their lives. When something isn't working out, they try again because shepherds are attracted to their sheep. Leaders are attracted to an idea. They are frequently worried about promotion and rank and recognition. Jesus is looking for disciples to become shepherds because the problem with the world is that there are so many people who are like sheep without a shepherd. Look around, friends. So many people feeling like sheep without a shepherd. Maybe you find yourself feeling that way sometimes. So how do we move from sheep to shepherd? Even today, Jesus wants us to be more like him. And he wants us to do it by engaging in three activities. Preach the gospel, not with sermons, but with the stories of our own lives that are meant to convince our friends and those we encounter about the power of God by seeing it in our lives. Second. <clears throat> preach the gospel, heal the sick, not always with the miraculous sign, but by touching them in ways that empower them and to help them cope with their diseases, whatever that may be, depression, addiction, whatever it may be, to help them cope with their disease. And third, deliver people from evil, not always by exercising like some demons like you see in the movie, but by helping them disentangle the things that are destroying them. 
Again, addictions, behaviors, sins, helping them, casting out demons. So where do you begin? <clears throat> How do we do this? You start right where you are, right where you are, just like Jesus with the first disciples. What can you do within the boundaries of your authority to improve the spiritual climate of the places that you have influence? Who in your field of vision needs to be fed? Who needs to be healed or delivered? You could start a Bible study. You could gather for prayer. You could organize a reading club. You could begin to witness. You could invite someone to lunch who is hurting and just listen to them. You could write prayers and circulate them throughout your family, throughout your workplace, or any organization that you are connected to. Jesus not only lived a life of faith before his disciples, but he called them to live a life of faith as well. First and foremost, he called them to put their trust in him as Messiah, as the Son of God, as the Christ. But he didn't stop there. He called them to be active. He wanted them to have an active, living faith. And that's what he wants for us and calls us to as well. A faith in God and God's presence in the affairs of everyday life. Whether for daily bread or for the power to heal the sick or to cast out demons or to overcome the perils of nature, they were to live by faith and they were to grow in faith. Each challenge that they encountered was an opportunity for growth. Each challenge that they encountered, they became a little more like mercy. They learned to be a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love, and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace. They learned to be a little more like Jesus and a little less like me. We are taught to earnestly seek to be filled with the Spirit of God each day and to be led by that Spirit in all of our ways. God, fill me with your Spirit and lead me in your Spirit today. Each step, each step that I take, each person I encounter. When we do, we will find that we can live in a newness of life that's exciting, encouraging. Not perfectly, and not immediately, but day by day as we walk by faith and obedience, the Spirit will produce in us the character of Jesus. That's how it works if you work it. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. God knows the world needs goodness. Kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and for God's sake, self-control. We serve a good shepherd. When we were lost and when we were aimless, he left his home to find us. When we were defenseless, defenseless to attack the sins of the enemy, he laid down his life for us. He is the shepherd who binds our wounds and heals our past hurts. It was compassion that moved the heart of Jesus to action. It was compassion that he did all he did. Today, he sees the crowds of people in our families, in our schools, in our communities, and in our workplaces. And again, he is moved by, with compassion because there are so many people who are shepherdless they have no one to guide them, no one to, to comfort them, and no one to stand in the gap against the attacks of life. Shepherdless. Again, Jesus is calling his disciples 
to pray and to follow him. It can be easy to pray for God to send someone else today. But Jesus is calling you. Pray for him to send you, to follow him. He's calling you. The microphone may have been off, but can you hear him? Can you hear him? Follow me. Whatever Jesus asks you to do, do it. You will protest that you don't have enough time, that you're too old, that you're too young, that you don't have the money, you don't have the education or the authority, that you are not adequate, that you don't have the connections, and that you don't know where to start. Somewhere in God's plan to save the world, God left room for us. Even now, Jesus calls us to move forward, quit following at a safe distance, and walk alongside him, helping him to do the things that he is trying to do in this world. It all begins when you hear that familiar voice of your shepherd say, those people over there are like sheep without a shepherd. You feed them. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Those people over there are like sheep without a shepherd. You feed them. Have you seen them? Or do you drive by them? You probably don't even notice sometimes. We can get so caught up, can't we? I know I'm guilty of that, but we are doing our best. And I know God smiles down. But it's not easy in this economy and in this culture today. There's a lot of change going on and a lot of things are coming out of COVID and people are still struggling. So I thank you because you make it possible. We need to do our best and we need to invite others. I invite you online to do what you can, please, to give to God, to use it as God chooses in this church to reach those who are shepherdless and to help us to, to grow through teaching and program and doing acts of kindness and love and mercy and grace so that we can become more like Jesus and less like ourselves. I thank you and I pray together now, Lord Jesus, Father God, as we receive this offering today, I thank you so much for the generosity of those who come and give to you so that you may use it and do what you do. Remind us, Lord, that it all comes from you to begin with and we are so grateful for each and everything that you have given us in life. Help us to use these gifts wisely to continue to follow Jesus and to reach out to those who he touched and healed. And Lord, make us to be those who transform lives 
and transform the world. In Jesus' name, amen. And now, go in peace. Have a great day, a great week. I look forward to seeing you next weekend. Bring a friend. Go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you feed them. Amen.